So good evening. Uh, my name is Barry Bowman. I'm the president of the UCSC Emeriti Association. Uh, so we want to welcome you for, to uh, one of our distinguished Emeriti lecturers. We do this twice a year. It's uh, a collaboration between the Emeriti Association and the Chancellor's Office. And I just want to say that uh, in the spring, uh, the lecture in May is going to be by Paul Lubeck, and he's going to talk about Islam and urban labor in northern Nigeria, a very different topic. Okay. So I urge you all to come to that. So the function of these lectures is to really uh, have a chance for our are very accomplished emeriti who continue to be very active in their retirement to, to present what they're doing and to kind of highlight the activities of the emeriti. There are about 290 living emeriti at UCSC, and so it's a group not that much smaller than the active faculty, and they make contributions in research and teaching in the arts, in philanthropy, in the community, and so this is our our little chance to do some advertising for what they are doing. Um, so tonight, our speaker is Bernie LaBeouf. Bernie and I were colleagues for more than 20 years in the biology department. Um, Bernie's name, LaBeouf, the origins of that. Uh, Bernie grew up in Cajun country in Louisiana. I think a little time in the Navy and then off to school and, for whatever reason, ended up in California uh, at UC Berkeley. So he got a bachelor's degree there, then a master's degree at what was San Francisco State College at the time, and then returned to Berkeley and got a PhD and a short stint at uh, UC Davis after that. So the two important dates in this introduction are first, 1961 because that was the date that the first elephant seal pup was born on Año Nuevo Island. And just a few years after that, in 1967, Bernie LaBeouf arrives at UC Santa Cruz. And the campus and the colony have kind of developed together, and Bernie has played a big role in both. Uh, so Bernie's done a lot of things in his career. Uh, he's done some administrative things. He was an interim v, uh, vice chancellor for research for a while. He had a, an important role in our collaboration with NASA Ames over in the other side of the hill. He's written two novels. He's an opera buff. He's a winemaker with his own vineyard. And he's done a lot of science, good science. He's had uh, more than 50 students and postdocs and uh, a, a lot of really seminal work. So when Bernie arrived here, apparently looked around, knew about the elephant seals, and so the insight that he had prompted him to work on beagles. Now why beagles, Bernie may tell us, I don't know, but he soon had second thoughts and started work, this work on the elephant seals for which he is so well known. And the main point I wanted to make is it's, it's a, an enormous accomplishment what he has done with this system, but it's not just about finding out about elephant seals. It's finding out about bigger questions of animal behavior and ecology and evolution and finding some overriding principles in in biology, and Bernie's going to tell us about that tonight. So, Bernie. I think I'm connected here. Can you hear me? Okay. How did I get here? Uh, let me give you the redacted version and start with graduate school. I went to UC Berkeley as a graduate student and I worked in a lab that emphasized uh, behavior and reproductive endocrinology, the effect of hormones on behavior. And the, prof the head professor was a very famous guy. I respected a great deal. It was a very stimulating atmosphere. 
My colleagues were all good people who turned out very well, and uh, it was good. But after a while, I decided that I did not want to spend the rest of my research career in a windowless lab studying rats, mice, chinchillas, uh, Japanese quail, and the like. I wanted to be outside. Well, about then, uh, UC Berkeley decided to put up a field station on Grizzly Peak, high above the campus, where there were large runs, outdoor enclosures, cages for birds, and there were anthropologists had some monkeys up there. Frank Beach had some dogs, and of course hyenas came later. And I jumped at the opportunity, and I did uh, my thesis on dogs. Now granted, this wasn't nature. It was a halfway house between the lab and nature. Uh, but that's the best I could do at the time. At the same time, my interests were going away from reductionistic lab science to ecology and evolutionary biology. And it's about that time that I was interviewed for a job at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, the interviewer, I remember, was uh, Kenneth Tiemann, who was the crown provost at the time and a renowned plant uh, physiologist. And I remember him saying, you know, Bernie, there is a seal and sea lion rookery up the coast, not very far away. And I wonder if in the future you would be interested in working with these animals. I replied, perhaps too hastily, yes, 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 of course. I knew woefully little about pinnipeds, these seals and sea lions. Well, I got the job, and I started in September of 1967. And, can you hear me? Ah, okay. And in December, I saw the seals and sea lions at Onion Wavell for the first time. I went out in a small dinghy with Dick Peterson, who was another assistant professor who'd done his thesis on Alaska fur seals. Uh, it's hard to describe what it was like approaching this island. There was just this explosion of life in the water, on land, in the air. Uh, there were the, 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 the sounds alone, the, the yak yak yakking of the sea lions, the uh, alarm calls, the, the bellowing of the elephant seals that were just starting to breed, the, the gulls squawking from up, up above, and uh, the pungent smells of the sea and the seaweed and the stink of the sea lions. It was all just mixed up. With, I, I was just dumbfounded. Eyes wide open, mouth ajar. I saw all kinds of possibilities. I had questions which Dick, who was an expert on fur seals, and there were no fur seals here, he could not answer. <clears throat> and the one thing I remember vividly is in those days, in the laboratory, a dominance hierarchy was what happened when you forced two animals to fight for a reward that only one could get. And based on these pairwise encounters, you decide that A beats B, B beats C, C beats D, and so on. A dominance hierarchy results uh, from that. Well, but this dominance hierarchy in the lab was, review, was viewed with a lot of skepticism, and certainly by Frank Beach, my professor at Berkeley, and rightly so. It was trumped up. It was forced, it was unreal, it was artificial. But here I was on the beach at Año Nuevo watching these two-ton bull elephant seals fighting, red in tooth and claw. It seemed to me like that's what was going on. There, there, there was a relationship between these individuals, and as I was to find out later, the rewards for the winners were great. Okay. Um, so after this significant uh, first encounter, impressive to me, I was all stoked up, I was excited, 
Indeed, on the drive back to Santa Cruz, I was already composing a grant proposal in my head. I was so excited about it. Okay, so, of course, I had no clue that I would be here something like 52 years later talking about the seals that I started studying way back then. <clears throat> Such is life. <laughs> but enough about me. <clears throat> what I want to do is talk about the winners and the looters, losers in this mating game that elephant seals play out on the beach, <clears throat> which has some significance for life in general. <clears throat> Let me um, show you the protagonist. This is a mugshot, male on top, female on the bottom here. And uh, this is a group photo, male surrounded by females. A pup is being squeezed right in the middle of the photograph there. And then let me go on to give you some background to put things in perspective. First of all, <clears throat> why elephant seals? Why not ants? Why not anteaters? Why not bears, <clears throat> coyotes, <clears throat> humans, uh, unicorns, whatever? <clears throat> well, it helps to consider <clears throat> mating systems and parental investment to put things in perspective. There are three common mating systems in birds and mammals, polygyny, monogamy, and polyandry. Polygyny means many females, and it's the most common one in mammals by far. One or a few males mate with numerous females. Most males do not mate at all, what a shame. And the males are apparent in one sense only. They provide half the genes to the offspring. They provide absolutely no parenting help at all. <clears throat> Elephant seals are extremely polygynous. So I thought it important, at least later on I did, to focus on the most extreme example of the most common mating system that you find in mammals. As for the other mating systems, monogamy, one mate at the time, common in birds and humans, life is tough. So both sexes must help to rear the young. Polyandry, meaning many males, is rarer still, very rare, and life is even tougher. This is a situation where the female needs a great deal of help, particularly in the few bird species that are polyandrous. The female lays several clutches of eggs, and uh, the environment is so rigorous that uh, many of them are lost. So she gets a different male to take care of each clutch. So she has many males. OK, so much for the mating system. And her lack of parental investment, which is done by the males in that case. <clears throat> well, elephant seals turned out to be an excellent choice in other respects. Uh, one can do many things with them that cannot be done with other animals. Simple things like they don't run away from you. They're not afraid of you. They don't hide. You can mark and tag individuals, and this is critical. If you're going to ask important biological questions in nature, you've got to be able to follow individuals, and you can do that with elephant seals. We could collect blood. We could collect tissue, hair, vibrissa. We can drug them to weigh them. We can attach, as Dan Costa back there knows, as we did a lot of this, attach various instruments to them to study their diving behavior and their migration patterns. So in a sense, the elephant seal became the sort of feel analog to what white rats were three or four or five generations ago in the laboratory. OK, second, what to study? <laughs> well, reproductive behavior is probably the most important thing that animals or living things do, for that matter. It's essential for the continuation of life. The reprodu reproducers shape the future. Uh, and the best metric for studying reproduction in nature is lifetime reproductive success. Uh, that is uh, success in leaving progeny or genes in the next generation. It provides the best approximation of Darwinian fitness. In a sense, it's the gold standard. Uh, moreover, 
If you do studies of lifetime reproductive success, it helps us to understand how natural selection operates, which is the, the general rule that affects all of us and all things. <coughs> but these studies of lifetime reproductive success are extremely rare. They require close monitoring of the reproduction of individuals in their natural environment throughout their entire lives. This is impossible for most animals because of where and how they live. Imagine doing this with howler monkeys way up there in the trees, or burrowing animals underground, or seals that breed on ice flows that break up uh, and are very dangerous, or fish or whales that you only see the tips of them and, and, and that's difficult enough to do, let alone follow their reproduction throughout life. So <clears throat> it takes a great deal of effort and indeed, in some mammals like elephants or killer whales, <laughs> the animals live longer than the research career of the investigators. So there's some problems there. <clears throat> so there are only a handful in nature, and I can't overemphasize this. The present study I'm talking about, and this is most important, the elephant seals, were only 19 miles away from campus. I didn't have to mount an expedition like many of my colleagues did, to study them in Africa, in Sumatra, or in the Antarctic. I could study them every day, uh, from day to day, from year to year, and over the years. Indeed, in the early years when I was here, I taught classes during the week, served on committees, and then I spent every weekend on the island studying elephant seals. I was lucky. Thank you, Kenneth Tiemann. Which sex? Well, the mating strategies of the two sexes are quite different. Males are selected to inseminate as many females as possible. This explains virtually everything males do. Females, on the other hand, more complicated. They want to find a safe place to give birth. They want to nurse their pups to weaning age. They want to get re-inseminated. And in the process, they want to have as many young as possible in their lives. But the reproductive potential is quite different. It's very high in males, and it's limited in females primarily because of pregnancy, which lasts an entire year. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, more to say, but uh, time is of the essence here. Males, just a word about them. We studied lifetime reproductive success, or we estimated it, years ago, and found that one or a few males dominate mating with 100 or more females. I just saw Adrian Zillman, and we talked about a male we studied years ago named ADR, after Adrian, who inseminated in four consecutive years, he was the alpha bull, and he inseminated, by our estimate, over 200 females. Good going, Adrian. Uh, Adrian. Well, uh, but in males we're studying mating, not paternity. Paternity is elusive in males. Who's the father? There's always a little bit of doubt, you know. Well, it's particularly difficult in elephant seals because elephant seals were exploited by the sealers beginning in the early 1800s, and by the late 1800s, 1890 was the nadir, uh, they were virtually extinct. Only a small group survived on this volcanic island 150 miles off the coast of Mexico named Isla de Guadalupe. We estimated, uh, working with geneticists, that there were less than 15 to 30 females in existence at the time. The only ones that survived, this remnant herd. So what happened is the population lost a great deal of genetic variability. Consequently, one cannot determine paternity of elephant seal males using DNA fingerprinting, because one male cannot be distinguished from another potential father. So you only have an estimate of LRS. So we get to the important sex here, the females, where you can determine with certainty that this pup belongs to that female because you know it came from her because it came out of her. So uh, maternity assurance is a sure thing here as opposed to paternity assurance, which is not. Moreover, uh, we know that all reproduction goes through the female, so they are the important sex to study, particularly from the point of view of, if you want to understand how a population of animals adapts to the environment, 
how it changes over time, it's most important to study reproduction in females. We expect that some females will do better than others, and we'd like to know why. Okay, so this talk's not about the flamboyant males. They attract all the attention because they're fighting and all that stuff. It's about the important females. Let me finish with uh, population history and simply say that the elephant seals made a remarkable comeback from near extinction. Uh, they, they started to increase from the mother colony in Mexico. <clears throat> they started breeding in the Channel Islands in Southern California in the 1930s. And they arrive at Año Nuevo, as Barry said, in 1961. We come in soon after that, and that's when this long-term study of northern elephant seals I will describe begins. The population continues to expand. There are about 300,000 animals in existence today. Basic female business. We've got to get that straight. Females begin arriving on the rookery in mid-December. Males are already there. Females join a group of other females that are called traditionally harems. Each female delivers a single pup about six days after she arrives. She's pregnant when she arrives. And uh, there are no twins. The mother nurses her pup for four weeks. During the last few days, she copulates. Uh, during the nursing period, the mother loses 40% of her mass. Meanwhile, the pup is about a little bit less than 100 pounds at birth, and at weaning four weeks later, it's about 300 pounds. It gains a lot of weight in a hurry. All of this from mother's milk, which is 55% fat. <clears throat> a good dairy cow, for perspective, is 4% fat. Gives you an idea. Female is also a capital breeder, which means that she provisions her pup using energy that she stored and accumulated earlier during her pregnancy while she was foraging at sea. <laughs> this is distinct from income breeders who are uh, nursing their pups while they themselves are feeding. So all nourishment in elephant seal comes from milk, from birth to weaning at one month of age, and all of that comes from the blubber which she has stored uh, and accumulated during the previous eight months at sea. This means that the pup's birth weight and the weaning weight reflects directly the mother's mass and her success foraging during pregnancy. It's a tight system here, closed system. Moreover, and this is remarkable too, the female fasts while she is nursing. Okay, continuing. After mating, the mother weans and abandons the pup, returns to sea to forage for about two and a half months. She's inseminated, but not technically pregnant yet. <laughs> she returns to the rookery to molt, which lasts a month. At the end of this period, the fertilized egg, which has been sort of waltzing around in the uterus, attaches to the lining, uh, to, to the uterine wall, and pregnancy proper begins. Uh, as a result, she returns to the rookery to give birth at about the same time every year as long as she lives. Uh, delayed implantation prevents this sort of scheduling. Okay, uh, this is a female nursing a one-week-old uh, pup, or one week or less. This is a female who is uh, still nursing a pup that's about to be weaned. You can see that it's considerably larger. <clears throat> what are the objectives? Well, the aim was to determine the lifetime reproductive success of a large sample of females observed over the course of 52 years. Uh, if this were a human study and you just, the analog would be, you would be doing a study of humans for 200 years because you take the maximum lifespan, 23 in seals, 100 in people. That would be a long study. Of course, I didn't do all this myself. A lot of people were involved. I'll come to that uh, when, when the talk is over. <clears throat> Basically, we wanted to determine variance, as I said. We wanted to determine the effects of the mother's age, mass, experience on survival and reproduction of the pups, how long the mother lived, uh, and so forth. Uh, we also wanted to determine if there are any signs of senescence or, or menopause uh, in, in the oldest females. Methods, we start off with over 8,000 females born in the years 1963 to 2008. 
And these animals are then monitored from 1968 to 2018. It's a small study, as you can see. Uh, we tracked marked individuals and kept score every breeding season. What does it mean when I say we, uh, we tracked them? Uh, we, 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 uh, we identified the seals with plastic alphanumeric tags which were put in the, the hind flippers at weaning. And then as adults, we marked them with either a, a, a bleaching agent or a dye so that we could recognize them easily uh, during the breeding season or during the molt. <clears throat> and then during the early 80s, we marked 372 females with permanent marks or brands. And that's important because it enabled us to, to make up for some of the, uh, the, the slop in the study. Uh, so the basic, what we called housekeeping, the stuff we did every year from the very beginning, was to determine uh, whether a female gave birth to a pup, whether she weaned it, what was its weight, what was its sex, what was its lifespan, did it survive, and what, uh, what was its potential for breeding. Of course, while we did this, we were doing various other studies along the way. But this one runs from the beginning to the end. <clears throat> okay, here, oops, let me go back, back, here you go. Uh, this is a mother and her pup, similar marks, so we can make sure that they belong to each other. Uh, here's a bleach mark on a subadult male named Irv, and it gives you an idea of what we could do, and it's very easy to read. Um, this is the laboratory, or the field study site. Uh, off to the other side is uh, Santa Cruz, and you're going up Highway 1, you come to Onion Wavo State Reserve, and this is Onion Wavo Island. There are two breeding locations on the island, and I don't have a pointer here, but from one end of the point to the other, you'll find various breeding locations where females uh, <clears throat> give birth. <clears throat> okay, uh, this slide shows you how we stored the data generally. Uh, each one of these are four females, just to give you an example. So here's Geo 85 at the bottom. She was born in 1998 and she died in 2017. Uh, the blue marks and age is at the bottom, age and years, and the blue marks indicate that she was there during the breeding season or the molting season, which is the, 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 the line below. And then we have various uh, uh, symbols here. P would mean that she was observed with a pup, plus that she weaned it, minus that she didn't wean it, or O, oh, that she was observed often, but she never had a pup, or we were uncertain because there were too few observations. Anyway, that gives you an idea of how we kept the data. <laughs> now let's talk about the data. <clears throat> Lifetime pup production. And here the sample size varies with whatever we're doing is over 7,000 females, 7,735. Lifetime produ pup production is at the bottom. There are two bars here, one is black and one is white. The black bars represent raw data, and I'm not gonna say much about that, except that the raw data overestimates mortality and underestimates lifetime reproductive success. And the reason for this is that the animals lose tags, or the tags get corroded. We try to prevent this by double tagging, but it's still a problem. The other thing that happens is females are there, but we overlook them. We don't see them, or we can't read the tag. And then lastly, females immigrate to a nearby rookery, like uh, Point Reyes or the Farallons. What we did was to, uh, we used a study in which 372 female weanlings during the mid-80s were marked permanently with brands. And we used this study to offset the biases that I just spoke about. That is to say, these are permanent marks, so the females could not lose them, so we could adjust the tag loss thing. Uh, the, uh, we also could not easily overlook them if they were there, even in a crowded harem, because the brands stand out. 
And lastly, when these animals showed up on a nearby rookery, once again, they're obvious, and we had colleagues or collaborators working there, and they would report that one of our animals showed up and they, we could account for it. Okay, so focus on the white bars. What's the general conclusion to the entire study? There's great variation in lifetime reproductive success in females of this species. Too many females produce no pups, a few produce a few pups, and, well, um, many produce few pups, I should say, and a few survivors produced a lot of pups. And I'm going to now flesh out the variance by talking about these three categories of, of variability. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> there is high mortality prior to breeding. As the figure shows here, if you look at 75 on the top of the white bar, 75% of the females that were weaned or that were in the sample produced zero pups. They died before they reached breeding age. Only one out of four survived to breed. Most of this mortality, virtually all of it, occurred while foraging at sea. And evidently, this is the greatest barrier to reproducing. I would say it's not surprising because when the pup is weaned and it goes to sea for the first time, it's, uh, it's weaned at a month, it goes to sea two and a half, at two and a half months of age, it's lost 25 to 30% of its weaning weight because it's fasting. Uh, it, it, all it's, has was, it's had was mother's milk, and now it's naive, it doesn't know what to eat, uh, it, it gets no help from... Uh, a friend or a colleague or a mother. Uh, it doesn't know where to find its prey or how to catch it, as well as what predators to avoid. The predators are white sharks and killer whales. Maybe there are others. Finding food is clearly important. <clears throat> Patricia Morris did a study years ago and found that after the first two foraging trips, when the pup is now 16 months old, it weighs no more than it weighs, weighed when it went to sea for the first time at two and a half months of age. So uh, the ax falls at that time in life. Uh, the second point is that uh, these animals that uh, have a lifetime pup production of one, two, three, four, five, six, let's say, uh, are in the majority on the rookery. Uh, young breeders, three to five years old, are the majority, for example, observing the rookery at any time. And the basic reason for this is they haven't died yet. Uh, we expected them to produce the most pups because they were most numerous, and as a group, have the greatest influence on the next generation. But this was not the case. What happened was that the majority of these young females died after producing only one or a few pups. For example, 50% of the survivors bred up to age six only before they died. Of these, 61% produced only one pup, 28, two pups, 9% three times, three pups. Well, uh, following on with why these females don't do very well, what this table shows you is a relationship between the age the female gives birth for the first time, age at primaparity, and her weaning success, as well as her lifespan. So here's females that gives birth first time at age three, and the weaning success at age three on the other side is 0.6, 60% of them wean their pups. If you wait a year to age four, it goes up to 72, age five, 73, and age six, 89%. Moreover, if you follow the female that's permiparous at age three, she improves with age. She goes from 60% the first time she breeds to 70, to 82, to 88, and lifetime averages out to 79. Okay, so weaning success varies as a function of age at primaparity. Also, the lifespan is associated with age at primaparity. With those primiparous at age three, the mean lifespan is a little bit over seven years, goes up to 8.6 in primiparous at age four, still at 8.1 for uh, 
age five, and age six goes way up to 9.1. Okay, so um, young females have a difficult time recovering from initial breeding events. <coughs> um, this finding is, well, for example, 40% of uh, 98 females that we studied in the mid-70s that were primiparous at age three, four, and five were not seen the next year, but were later determined to be alive. It's as if uh, there is a cost to this first breeding, and it's not surprising because the females are breeding at an age where they're still growing. So they have to, they have to take energy that is used for growth and channel it to reproduction, and this involves a cost which is reflected in lifespan and lower reading success. <clears throat> There's more. Uh, the relationship between pups weaned and mother's age. Here you have mother's age, here you have the proportion of pups weaned, and this, this graphic shows you that young females, three, four, five years of age especially, are, are very poor at weaning pups, and they increase with experience and then they reach an asymptote at about 89, 90% once they get to be six years old or older. <clears throat> okay, there, there are multiple reasons, again, for, for why this occurs. Uh, young females do stupid things when they give birth for the first time. I mean, they give birth back there, but they're looking for their pup in front. Uh, it doesn't work. In addition, they're often moved away from their pups by more dominant, larger, older females who are, as a group, dominant to them. They're re relegated to the periphery where nursing is often disrupted by males who are continually trying to get into the harem to mate with females. It disturbs nursing. It causes mother-pup separation, which is the primary cause of death in pups on the rookery. Moreover, uh, young females have less, they're smaller, so they have less reserves from which to produce milk to feed their pups, and so the pups get less and the pup, pups are smaller. Okay. Uh, now let me go to that final segment. Of, there were some females, a few of them, who, that were exceptionally successful in uh, producing pups, and they were long-lived, multiparous. This was the biggest surprise of the study, actually. Uh, less than 1% of the survivors fit into this category, uh, but they were responsible for most of the pups produced. Six, I'll come to that again later, most of the pups, despite the fact that they were outnumbered considerably by the other survivors. These are what I call the super moms. Uh, some details amplify the extraordinary performance of these females. First of all, they started breeding early, at age three or four. As I stated earlier, breeding early is a gamble because most females lose, but great benefits accrue to those that pull it off. And that's what these super moms, females who gave birth to 10 pups or more in life, do. They, they gamble and they win. They're an exception to the rule. Let me show you. Here are the super moms at the top, and this is pups weaned, and this is mother's age. Right from the very beginning, they're doing a great job, whereas the generic females, the other females, suffer during those early years, and it takes them a while to get up to the, the, the norm. <clears throat> so this is kind of like investing money in the stock market early before others and reaping compound, genetic, uh, compound interest. In the case of the seals, it's compound genetic interest that the females gain. <clears throat> so after that, they're breeding consistently every year through a long life. For example, one female produced 20 pups in her lifetime. She lived to age 23, so the longest lived females, female that we observed. Another female produced pups in 16 consecutive years, 12 produced pups in 14 years, 15 and 13, and so on. Obviously, uh, these females live long lives, okay. Uh, I want to focus on these females and look at the data in a slightly different way. 
I want to arrange the whole sample uh, into 700, 7, over 7,000 females into what I call parity groups or para groups. By para one, I mean all the females that gave birth to only one pup. Para two, I mean all the females as a group that gave birth to two pups and so forth. Okay, uh, this reveals a number of points to make. First of all, uh, what I've already said before, the para zero group, uh, for over 5,000 females are in it, 75% of the sample produce no pups at all. Uh, the, something like 19% uh, of the sample that produce one to nine pups in their lives produced 45% of the total pup production. On the other hand, the old females that produced 10 to 20 pups, and there were only 6% of them in the sample, produced 55% of the total prep production. And despite the fact that there were three times more of these survivors in the zero to nine category. So once again, these old, multiparous, long-lived females stand out. Number two, I want to point out just as an example, if you look at the para one category, there are 326 females in that group, and of course they produce 326 pups. But look at the para 19 group. There are only 17 females in that group, but they produce an equal number of pups as the 326 females in the para-1 group. That is to say, there are 20 times more pups in the para-1 than the para-19 group, and they produce an equal number of pups. Para-16 and 17 uh, produce the most pups, 973, 990. And the other thing you may notice here is that when you come to the end of life here, and these older females, senescence rears its ugly head. Uh, and uh, although there's no sign of menopause, there is a decline in uh, pup production. And um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. Okay, you can do this one more way. Maybe I'm gilding the lily here, but if you group the groups into one to five para groups, 1109 females, and they produce 28, 71 pups. Look at 16 to 20. There are only 179, six times less, and they produce even more pups. Well, once again, makes the same point. These older females prevail. Um, they have a significant uh, influence on the next generation, I would say. The other thing that, that jumps out of this is if you look at the pup's weight at weaning as a function of the mother's age, you can see that as a female ages, she produces larger pups, going from about 0.9 kilograms to close to 140 kilograms. Bigger females wean larger pups. Bigger females have more to give. <clears throat> One more slide here. Uh, this is a relationship between uh, future breeding and lifespan as a function of weaning mass. Here on the left, I don't have a pointer, mean weaning mass. And it goes from pups that only weigh about 80 kilograms at weaning to some that weigh 160 kilograms. Well, as the weaning mass increases, you can see that the mean lifespan doubles, goes from 101. 1.08 to 2.86. Similarly, as the weaning weight goes up, the probability triples from 12% possibility to 36%. Uh, this is another graphic showing you pretty much the same thing, that weaning mass <clears throat> and probability of breeding goes up as a function <laughs> of mass at weaning. <clears throat> okay, here's a small weanling, here's a large one. You can see that there's enormous difference between those. 
So in essence, uh, I don't have much to say there. Uh, we, what you did tend to see in the last couple of years of life is an increase uh, in, in the failure to wean pups. They show a decline in the ability to wean their pups. And they show a moderate decrease in the weaning mass of their pups. They don't give as much, despite the fact that they're as large as they were three or four or five years earlier. They're not doing it. Most of them continue to breed until they die. Uh, uh, indeed, 91% of the oldest females, that is to say those that were 18 or older, uh, bred to one to four times after reaching that age. Uh, a 22-year-old female weaned her pup. Uh, no question about that. We, we documented that. Um, I don't want to go there. I'll, let me, before I get there, let me just say this. We were interested in following the daughters of super moms. We were, we were able to do that with two of them. It's very difficult to do. You know, you have to double up. But there were two super moms who were very successful in life who produced daughters who themselves became super moms. Indeed, both the mothers and the daughters bred at the same general location and overlapped in time. But we never saw any sign of the mothers recognizing their daughters. I think after weaning, that's just the end of it. Uh, certainly no sign of them helping anyway. Of course, this is much too small to say anything about the genetic legacy, but, but, but this is something that might be done in the future. Okay, let me uh, give you the take home message here. Uh, Natural selection is a grim reaper. Most females die before they get a chance to breed. It's even worse among males because females at least start breeding at age three, in some rare cases age two. Males don't even get a chance to enter the harem to, to shake hands with a female until about age eight, so m many of them die. Two, young females are very numerous, uh, but they have a short breeding light, life and they do a poor job of weaning pups. So uh, their influence is not proportional to their number. The big point, of course, is that long-lived multiparous supermoms prevail. Uh, you would think they would have the greatest contribution to the gene pool uh, in the next generation and in future generations. Another interesting thing, particularly to specialists, is that there's more variability in lifetime reproductive success among females than we expected. Indeed, that's almost as much as there is uh, in females as there is in males, with the exception of the alpha bull who's off the scale. Uh, okay. Five, uh, lifetime reproductive success is almost as... Well, I said that already. Uh, why are some females so much more successful than others? You have to talk about the attributes of these super moms here. And I'll make a number of points. <clears throat> First is that they live long. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute, but they live longer. Number two, they're exception to the rule and they start breeding early and they wean pups at a higher rate. Number three, and this is important, is as they age, comes an increase in size, which is associated with a number of things, producing larger pups, larger weanlings, that have a high survival rate and high probability of breeding. Foraging well and accumulating more energy to feed their pups, which produces larger pups. Um, for example, here's a slide. This is a study we did some time ago. Dan Crocker was the head, uh, was the lead author on this. And what it shows you is parturition mass of the female and her maternal age. And you can see all the, all the, the data points are going up. And what we're looking at here is the, oh, I can't read it there. It's the pup energy storage in megajoules milk energy in megajoules as well as megajoules per day, energy expenditure, and energy expenditure per day. All of these go up. Okay, another point is older females, as they increase in size, are dominant as a group, which puts them in a tranquil place to give birth and nurse, which is just the opposite of the smaller females. 
Number four, they locate near the alpha male where it's not only tranquil, but they get more likely, get inseminated by the, the alpha bull who's a male of demonstrated fitness, who's most likely to produce male offspring to the extent that this is genetically transmitted his traits that themselves become alpha males. So if you're a mother, you would like a, a, a son or a grandson uh, that will become an alpha male. And that's the way you do it, is you sit close to him. Experience, these older, larger females learn to protect their pups. They don't get separated from them. They guard against milk stealers. Females lose, some pups lose their mothers. They get separated from them, and they're forced to steal milk from mothers that are not their own. These older, larger females don't allow that, and, and it's, it, it makes sense. Finally, and this is an irony, is that uh, most females, and surely the, the uh, super moms, um, are pregnant, are nursing throughout their entire adult life until death. From the time they start breeding until they die, they're, they're either breeding, they're either pregnant or nursing. Okay, well, why do these supermoms live so long? Uh, well, we know they don't die on the rookery. They don't die on land, because we've been sitting there on land looking at them for over 50 years. The only other place they can die is at sea. Uh, so evidently, these supermoms must do better at avoiding the pitfalls of making a living at sea, that is to say, avoiding predation, avoiding getting caught in drift nets, ghost nets, set nets, avoiding getting hit by ships that strike them, and they also do a good job of getting food. Why is that? Uh, I'm not sure, I can speculate, but clearly this is a problem for the next generation of elephantologists. Okay, I want, to, <clears throat> I want to conclude with a parable. <clears throat> you remember the first line of that old hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? Well, we've got to change this tune to the aged rock, it is clear to me. And yes, there is a cleft, a division, in lifetime reproductive success between the numerous young females and the few long-lived supermoms. Supermoms rock and rain. A lot of people played a role. Many more people than are listed here. Short-term memory, I, I just can't recall, but uh, a lot of people did a lot of work over the years. Uh, colleagues like uh, Leo Ortiz, Dan Costa, Yasuhiko Naito, Dick Peterson in the very beginning, collaborators like people on adjacent rookeries that sent us their data, like Brian Hatfield, Harriet Huber, William Seidemann, Ron Jameson, Sarah Allen, and of course graduate students uh, who are in purple here uh, played a key role in that, and undergraduates as well. I think Sarah Mesnick was an undergraduate here and she did an awful lot, Kathy Pankin, and, and so forth. Uh, but I really want to call special attention to Rick Condit, Joanne Ryder, and Pat Morris. Joanne Ryder and Pat Morris were in this from virtually the beginning, uh, shortly after I got here, and uh, wanted to study females, uh, wanted to keep a record of how well they did, uh, certainly uh, did a lot of the housekeeping uh, through the years, and uh, devoted, uh, contributed ideas and so forth and, and played a key role. Rick Condit did some of this as well and he still does, but most important, he was the data manager who put the data in a form where we could query it, ask questions, and uh, uh, did a formidable job. Thank you very much. Okay, so let, let me say that uh, right afterwards, there will be some cookies and tea and coffee out in the lobby. So questions, for, questions for Bernie. There are two microphones, one on each side though, and uh, the manager is asked that you use the microphones if you have a question. 
If everything is clear and you have no questions, that's fine too. Well, let me ask one then. As a, as a molecular biologist, I'm curious about the genetics of this. I know they went through a, a bottleneck, so question one, is there much genetic variation in elephant seals? Uh, well, there certainly is not in males, uh, not enough to determine paternity. That's how I was going to win my Nobel Prize, and I was just stymied there. I couldn't do it. We couldn't tell who the dads were, and it's still that way. We spent a lot of work on it. You can do this with southern elephant seals. Similar species, uh, but they didn't go through a severe bottleneck like the northern. Now, you do see considerable behavioral differences, but that doesn't seem to be reflected in the genotypes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure somebody will come back to that. It makes for a cleaner system. Of so. course, of course. <laughs> okay. Up there. Mike? Yeah. Uh, you do. You do. <laughs> I was told to tell you that. Okay. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, how do we know that the uh, super moms really are different than ordinary moms? And there's going to be some, uh, and they'll have different luck, obviously. I, I say what? How do we know it's not just all luck and that they're really, you know, basically the same, uh, the regular moms and the super moms? Some of them, by luck, are going to be larger, you know, uh, in their first year, they get an extra start, you know. I mean, is there anything that we really know is different about them, other than luck? Well, you know, I, goodness, I've had some colleagues who died, and I'm still standing here. I mean, <laughs> is that luck, good genes, uh, or did I live a good life? Is it the cocktail a day that keeps me living longer? I mean, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I tried to point out that uh, they, they gambled and they won. Uh, if you get to that point where you get bigger, there are a lot of attributes that come with that that make you better. But I think the key thing is what's going on at sea, because that's where all the deaths are occurring. Uh, and, and they've learned how to deal with that. We know from, again, Dan Crocker's studies. Uh, Dan Costa, you here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, during El Nino's, that there's great variation in how well females do foraging at sea. Some do much better than others. Some don't gain weight at all in a bad El Nino year. So uh, we would have to go back through, we've talked about this, and look at, we have an extensive tagging record at this institution that continues to this day. And uh, it, it, it's, it's worthy of looking at in detail and seeing if you can answer some of those questions from looking at those data. I don't think that's been done yet, though. Yeah. I put a butt here in front. Thanks, Bernie, a great talk. Thank you. Um, you started off with a really small diversity genetically. Yeah, I think you said 30 somewhat females? Yes. Does the genetic diversity increase through mutations, or how can it increase from beyond that small population? I, I think it's mutation, that's it, and that takes a long time to accumulate. And once you've lost it, you know, you spent eons building it up and selecting the best mutations, and all of a sudden you lose a lot of these combinations. It's an interesting question. There are a few other species like that where uh, they're uh, genetically depauperate. I mean, I think seahorses are one animal that's that way. It'd be interesting to look at all of them and see how they hang together. You would think, I mean, I was naive about this, I'm not a geneticist, but I would my sense early on was that because they're genetically depauperate, they might be less capable uh, of adjusting to a change in the environment, uh, particularly with something like food. But I don't know. Uh, I've had colleagues that say, no, well, that's not it. So, but it's a good question. Have you tried elephant seal milk? And should we 
encourage Shoppers Corner to bottle it. <laughs> uh, that'd be quite a milkshake, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, I haven't. I have had snotter, though. What's that? The nose. <laughs> the, the sealers, that, that was their favorite part. And in particular with the southern elephants, it was the snotter. And uh, I read about it in a book. I said, well, we'll have to try that. Well, I've had some crazy graduate students, but I don't know if, they, and even, if even they tried it. Uh, it. We've collected milk, I'll say that. Yeah, good point. I don't know. 55? Yeah. I mean, it, it's cream, uh, actually. Uh, yeah. Roger up there. One male, named after Adrian Zillman, ADR, four years in a row. And again, we estimated that he mated, inseminated, over 200 females. What happened to him? We preserved his semen. <laughs> no, he died eventually. I mean, usually most males, you know, they, uh, males and females, it's kind of like, there's an analogy with a slot machine. Well, the strategy for males is uh, you can only play a slot machine that wins a jackpot or nothing at all. So you play, you rarely win, but when you win, you win really big. Females, it's a slot machine that comes up cherries most of the time. You don't win much, but you win consistently, and every female wins. So the way to win big is to live long. Okay? Anyway, I, I don't know how far that goes with you. But you, did I answer your question? Uh, can I just follow up on it? Yeah. Isn't alpha male usually a one and done strategy? That, I mean, that, there is that, an Thank you, but... because I was going to follow up on that. You're right. I was going to say that and I forgot. Is that usually most males die after they have one very good year. And, and most males only have one very good year. If they do that, uh, they've succeeded immensely. But ADR was an exception. Okay, one. There. Yeah. But the method looks. Well, the method's pretty straightforward, particularly with weanlings or what we call weaners. Is uh, we put this plastic tag in the interdigital webbing of the hind flippers, and the, the animal's lying on its side and it's sleeping. And if it's sleeping on its side, you can tell the sex, so you get the sex, and you. You simply click it, the animal wakes up, looks around, and goes back to sleep. <laughs> but it gets difficult if you want to tag a female, an adult female, uh, because you have to watch the other animals, you have to watch your back. That's the most dangerous thing. And it's even more difficult for a male because the flesh is very thick, and it's cold in winter, and you're getting older, and you, oh, God damn. And, and the tail flies up when you tag the animal, so you're following it up. And sometimes the tag pliers go pinwheeling into the air, and you have to recover them. Okay, so there's that. With, with the, uh, the dye or the bleach marks, and we use a combination of Lady Clarol Ultra Blue and Hydrogen Peroxide. Even the beauty and the beast use it, you know. Anyway, uh, what you do is you sneak up on a sleeping animal. And it's very easy. With the, with the uh, bleach, you simply drip it on. You write a name or a number, whatever you want. And with the dye, it's the same thing. It's just that it's a different color. It's black. That's basically it. But that animal's sleeping, but aren't there animals all around it that you're creeping up? Yep, that's what you've got to watch. Is, uh, you, you try to pick those off on the periphery, and uh, you have to be selective. Yeah. Okay, so maybe one last question, Franz. Okay, two. <laughs> we'll, we'll do two. these two here. Bernie, the uh, the length and the complexity of uh, of this study that 
that you initiated is quite extraordinary. Um, are there any other long-term studies of mammals or birds, for that matter, that you would compare yeah, this one to? Is there any other uh, the, equivalent? The, the best study is uh, the red deer of Rum in, in Scotland, uh, studies by Tim Cluttenbrock and his colleagues. Uh, and they've done an incredible job. Uh, they, can, they go one step further than we can. They know that the most successful females produce group of females or daughters that themselves are successful. They follow them genetically. The difference is, though, these animals were introduced on this island, and they're restricted. And it's, I don't recall that there are any predators anyway. So it's different. Elephant seals are wild animals. Uh, the red deer are sort of similar. But it's an excellent study. There are some studies of birds, martens, for example. Uh, it's in a book by Clutton Brock on lifetime reproductive success. But it, it's tricky. Birds are hard to follow, you know. And, uh, um, naked mole rats, really, they, they do a pretty good job there, too. But I'm talking about a handful of studies. OK, one last yeah. one over there. Yeah, so just out of curiosity, how long do the pups have to be separated from the females in order for the mom not to recognize them before weaning? Uh, that's difficult. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe just a day or two. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. What happens is that they get separated, bodies come between the mother and her pup, and then it's just chaos. And the pup is moving off, away from the mother. The mother knows, doesn't know which way to, to look, and uh, it, it's a dangerous situation. And of course, the bulls are moving around, trying to mate with everything that's moving, and to them, a pup in its path is like a piece of furniture. They just go right over it, you know. And when the pups are less than a week old, they get trampled and uh, they, they, some will die. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you much, Bernie. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>